Welcome everybody to the session called uh, termed nano vaccines from packaging to targeting and controlled degradation. My name is uh, Volker Meilander and I'm hosting this session together with uh, Stefan Grappe. We are both from the University of Mainz uh, from the dermatology department here. Um, Stefan Grappe is also the speaker of the Co collaborative research center of 166 where I'm also participating. Um, and we are interested in uh, drug delivery uh, of nanoparticles since a long time in this uh, collaborative research center. And uh, I think we have a packed list of people talking about exactly this, the use of nanoparticles and how we can go from, um, from, the, uh, from their use as it has been in, in experimental uh, medicine to, uh, 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 to a clinical approach. And our first speaker is Dan Peer. He's the Vice President of Research in Tel Aviv um, University. He's the Director of Laboratory of Precision Nanomedicine. Uh, he demonstrated the systemic delivery of RNA molecules, especially RNA interference, um, and how it affects immune system and inflammation. And I just read that he also got in 2017, he received, among others, uh, um, awards. He received the 2017 Nano Awards as the major contribution to the field of clinical nanomedicine in Klinam, uh, in the 10th meeting of Klinam in Basel, Switzerland. And we hope to be there again soon. So, Dan, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present uh, some of our work. I'm going to share my screen. Um, for some reason, I cannot, but let's try again. No, it's disabled. So until it is, still it's disabled. So we need some uh, technical uh, assistant that will help us to make sure that we can share screens. Okay, are you uh, are you on a, on a Windows or on a Mac? Yes, and uh, now you can do it, I think. Yes, okay. now I can. Everything is Perfect. fine. Perfect. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about uh, delivery of RNA mostly from gene silencing to gene editing. Um, our lab was the first to show systemic delivery of uh, RNA, siRNA first to immune cells and the first to show messenger RNA just a few years ago in an animal. So the central dogma of biology is very simple. Basically, you go from DNA to RNA to proteins. And of course, these are examples uh, between the differences of DNA and RNA. Um, it's very, very intriguing how we try to really target organs, but for us, it's more intriguing to really penetrate into specific cell types. And in, you know, in biology, you either had a non or overfunctional protein, a toxic protein, too much of a protein, or too little of a protein. These are all the examples that basically could be encoded. And from a therapeutic standpoint, as I mentioned, the field of DNA has been active for over 40 years. The field of proteins have been active for more than around 40 years. And the field of RNA is now booming, as we all know. And you can silence genes with RNA, you can activate them, you can edit them, you can replace them. And we all know that because we have good examples already in the clinic that siRNA has been used to silence genes, mRNA has been used to activate genes. We have some uh, very early clinical data suggesting that genome editing could be done also with RNA. And I'm gonna give you some examples of this with our work. So the challenge or the, one of the biggest challenge in RNA therapeutics is the appropriate delivery system. And these are the classical requirements. And we all know that um, lipid nanoparticles have been really booming in the last year, predominantly through the fact that we have a new two vaccines, one the BioNTech Pfizer one and the other one the Moderna. But already in 2018, uh, the FDA approved on PATRO, which is an siRNA that is encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles and predominantly in ionizable lipids with some helper lipids and stabilizers. So we basically in our lab are using microfluidic systems, mostly from precision nano uh, systems. And 
uh, the lab is divided into two major group, people that are doing RNA delivery, going all the way from lipid synthesis, and we have the largest lipid library probably in the, in the world with more than 1,200 different lipids. Some of them have been licensed. Some of them are in clinical testing. Uh, we also generate monoclonal antibodies and do some protein engineering that for basically creating specific targeting approach. And on the other side, we do exome and transcriptome analysis to really try to target, to identify new potential targets and to combine them together into a single vehicle. We all know that human disorders are very complex. There are different cell types that are involved. And as I mentioned, we have an interest in delivering sRNA, mRNA, circular RNA, self-amplifying RNA, et cetera. The targeted delivery platform today, I'm going to talk only about antibodies, but we have a lot of experience with ligand peptides, aptamergers as well. So we developed a strategy just a few years ago uh, to orient antibody on a surface of lipid and nanoparticles using what we call a linker strategy or the asset. The asset is Anchor Secondary Single Chain Enabling Targeting that was developed in my lab uh, by Ranit Kedmi and Nofar Vaiga. And basically provide you the opportunity to really uh, control the orientation of antibodies uh, in a very smooth manner. Also, you need much less of an antibody. We utilize this platform to generate different therapeutic and drug discovery tools. And for example, you basically mobilize uh, anti-beta-7 antibody on the surface. You inject it systemically. If you have a marker, for example, a labeled uh, siRNA, and you can go to all leukocyte subsets. If you put an anti-CD3, you can go to in vivo to T cells. If you put an anti-CD4, a subset of T cells. And if you go to, for example, if you put an anti-CD25, you can really reach a subset of the subset. So we are much interested in, in different uh, therapeutic uh, applications, among them hematological malignancies, solid tumors, inflammation, viral infection, and some rare genetic diseases. And today I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna share with you some interesting uh, information about some of those indications. So a new work that was published two weeks ago as a cover of advanced material is the work of uh, Siong Bong Yong, uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And he basically uh, used a therapeutic approach of silencing the target gene was hemoxygenase 1. It's a very, very interesting target. Actually, one gene that can do two things in, in parallel. And the target receptor was PDL1. And basically, a single gene, hemoxygenase 1, basically re uh, sensitized chemo resistant uh, tumors in one hand. And on the other hand, create an immunomodulatory function in tumor myeloid cells. If you bring together one particle that can do really two different approaches, you can get really stellar uh, data on this. And I actually advise you to read this interesting manuscript. So at least this uh, approach seems to be working. Uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, another example, we wanted to go not only to the specific um, receptor, but to do something a little bit more innovative and to go after the specific conformation. So some receptor undergo conformational changes, for example, integrins, and we decided to move and target the specific conformation of one of the integrin alpha-4, beta-7 during inflammatory bowel diseases. So the therapeutic approach was silencing, um, the target gene was interferon gamma, and the target receptors, receptors that undergo conformational changes, and behind this work were Dr. Niels uh, Dams, a postdoc uh, in my lab, previously now in Janssen. And what Niels has done is basically being inspired by leukocytes homing, how leukocytes interact with endothelial cells. He basically engineered the natural ligand, Madicam-1, as you can see, play a very important role in uh, the rolling and the arrest process of leukocytes. And uh, we also know that some signals can cause inside out signaling from a low affinity integrin to a high affinity binding one. And we wanted to lock the protein in a way that will uh, basically help us penetrate into those leukocytes. And what Niels has done is to engineer the first two domain of the natural Madicam one, D1, D2. 
and uh, basically fuse them to human FC and then, uh, sorry, to Marine uh, FC, and then it's been recognized by our linker system. And I'm gonna show you some data, which is actually quite striking. When you inject this systemically in IBD model, you'll find that uh, T cells that naturally home to the gut during the inflammation, during inflammatory uh, bowel disease, actually could be uh, silenced. And we're talking about only less than 15%. This is a new population looking at different, um, uh, I would say different markers. This is a new population that is very interesting and it raised the question, can we really use this tiny population of T cells, only around 15% of the T cells as new diagnostic markers and are they good for therapeutics? For the first question, we use MicroPET CT and answer it basically by imaging. And we were able, of course, everything you can see goes to the gut, to the, um, sorry, to the liver, but we can visualize early onset of the disease in the uh, gut area when you have colitis, induced colitis, compared to healthy or compared to um, basically control uh, protein, you have a mutated D1, D2 here. So um, from a therapeutic standpoint, we injected four IV administration uh, into an IL-10 knockouts, experimental IL-10 knockout mice. And you can appreciate the fact that silencing interferon gamma, sorry, has a lot of potential as a therapy and everything else is, is basically in the manuscript, including colonoscopies of mice, as well as histologies. As a control, we also use an anti-TNF alpha antibody, basically a kind of a mouse remicade. And you can appreciate the fact that it can neutralize all TNF, but also you can appreciate the fact that from a colon histological score, a colon length or other parameter is as good as, and actually these guys can reduce a lot of adverse effect. So we have probably identified a new class of uh, leukocytes, that have conformational changes that are homing into the gut, binding the ligand, the natural ligand, in a way that will be beneficial also for the delivery. So this is the first conformational sensitive uh, targeting of lipid nanoparticles with RNA. So this approach seems to be also opening up new avenues for different ideas. Um, the alternative approach is to go after activation. So in this uh, work, we have shown that we can target during the inflammation a subset of cells, basically mononuclear phagocytes, expressing the Ly6C uh, receptor and deliver mRNA that encodes for IL-10. With this, this secreted IL-10 can change the gut microenvironment. And this was uh, uh, the first paper showing systemic delivery of mRNA in a cell specific manner just a few years ago. So this approach also works quite nicely. So I just told you about uh, some activities that we have done with silencing and with activation, but now I'm gonna share with you some data about genome editing. So predominantly the work was done by Daniel uh, Rosenblum and Anna Gutkin now in NYU and published in two sets of papers. And we all know that in cancer, genome editing is very, very untraditional. Uh, because we usually are looking at monogenic diseases. So the traditional cancer therapy, as we all know, include radiation, surgery, chemotherapy, their broad range of adverse effect, drug resistant and high recurrency rate. What is the potential solution to create a targeted version that can really take up specific genes, knocking out them uh, in, a, in really different pathways? So uh, I'll show you a proof of concept study and then a short movie about this. So we all know what is the CRISPR system and what is the advantage of using it, but we probably less know that they're needing two compounds, the Cas9 protein and the single guide RNA that needs to have a sequence complementary to the target DNA. And in fact, it's a big challenge because you need to be able to control this process precisely. And there are two options. One, when you have a template and then you can create a knocking version 
and the other that you don't have a template, and then the right indices are cutting out and you have a knockout version. We decided to move and try this one because in 2014, when we tried working on this, started working on this project, there was a single paper by Fang Zhang published in Nature showing that they can get 6% editing in the liver. So that was our goal, to go beyond 6%. And there are three options. You can deliver a Cas9 protein together with single guide RNA. You can deliver a plasmid of Cas9, and you can deliver the messenger RNA of Cas9 that encodes to Cas9 with a guide RNA. We chose number three. But we have to take into account when we are talking about large creatures, 4,600 base pair. This is the Cas nucleus. And of course, you need the single guide RNA. So it took us about three years to understand what's going wrong. How come we cannot entrap these guys together in a single particle and get really stellar editing? And when we looked at the mechanism, we really realized that Cas mRNA is being translated. This process takes time, whereas the single guide RNA is being degraded when we deliver them to together or in parallel. So together with IDT, mostly Mark Belke, Ashley Jacobi and others, we designed new types of stable chemically modified guide RNAs, which we call XR guide RNA, now available. Um, and now basically it provides more time for the mRNA to be translated and recognized basically when the protein is set up. So just quickly showing you that starting from DLIM MC3 DMA that deliver siRNA, we need something bigger. MC3 is not good enough for this. So we had to go to create our own screen. We generated, as I mentioned, very large lipid library. Among them, we tested a few, for example, and found that some of them are really, really good carrier for mRNA uh, and the guide RNA together. So lots of different physical chemical properties and everything is published already, but we identify one lipid that can really take almost 100% of the mRNA and single guide and really do the job. So in terms of tumor models, we used a marine orthotopic glioblastoma model, highly metastatic and a human metastatic ovarian adenocarcinoma. Uh, we disrupt the gene PLK1, which is expressed in both the ovarian cancer and the GBM. You can see stellar results in terms of gene editing, both in the GBM uh, cells and the ovarian one, and cell arrest and cell death. When we translate this in vivo, basically, we're able to inject stereotactically into the hippocampus, the GBM cells that are labeled, and two days later showing 70% genome editing in a single dose, or 75% if we are using GFP. So two different genes, GFP is a control, cells are labeled with GFP, or a genome editing of the PLK1, pololykinase is a cell cycle inhibitor. Um, and basically we also show that it's specific and cause apoptosis at the end. Another thing we have done is basically following up therapeutically by injecting 30 mice per group either PBS, single guide GFP as a control with CRISPR LNPs, or the targeted one, single guide PLK with CRISPR LNP. The follow-up was weight, body weight, and looking at the imaging. And what we have found that the one that has single guide PLK had tiny tumor, again, single injection, a day 10 post-tumor inoculation, the overall survival uh, basically was increased to 30%, the median to 50%, and that again, single agent. We repeated this with systemic administration of metastatic model and basically using the asset system. And basically, I just wanna say that those tumors overexpress epidemic growth factors. So for us, an anti-EGFR antibody was in place. Um, and what we have done is to inject the cells of CAR8 into the peritoneum of the mice then inject the particles that are labeled, and then do a tumor targeting analysis. And basically you can find out that there is co-localization with a targeted version compared to the isotype control particles. And we got also genome editing, everything is done blindly. 
in IDT. So we send the tumors and, uh, and they do the NGS. Uh, the next generation sequencing, the editing was 80%, which is actually quite a lot. And then if we look at therapy, we had uh, using four different um, treatment, isotype control with single guide GFP, targeted anti-EGFR with single guide GFP, isotype with single guide PLK, and targeted anti-EGFR with single guide PLK. And we follow up for 60 days, two injection at day 10, at day 15. And what we got is actually stellar. We got 80% overall survival in those two. You can see smaller tumors in the, in the peritoneum area. And it seems to be uh, something that we would like to translate into the clinic. So just to summarize this very quickly, I would say that we've developed this novel and highly efficient lipid nanoparticle platform for delivery of Cas9 mRNA and single guide with this trap PLK uh, by uh, CRISPR LNP. We show significant G2M cell cycle risk and cell death. We've shown apoptosis, tumor growth inhibition, and prolonged survival in tumor bearing mice, and the targeted versions to increase overall survival and inhibit uh, tumor growth. I just want to thank my lab, the companies that license some of our work and work with us. Uh, Neovac is a, a company in Oxford that are uh, using new generation of lipid, really stellar. Uh, for vaccines. And one more short animation is this one. Cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide. Cancer cells divide without proper control due to genetic mutations within them. Most traditional cancer treatments are insufficient and cause severe side effects because they harm not only the cancer cells, but healthy cells as well. To make cancer treatments more efficient, we at Pair Lab have developed special lipid nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are able to recognize the mutated gene within the cancer cell and destroy it. Allow us to explain how they operate. We insert two RNA molecules into the lipid nanoparticle, a messenger RNA that has the instructions to build the CRISPR protein Cas9, which acts like a surgeon's scalpel, and a guide RNA designed to direct the Cas9 specifically to the target gene. On the outer surface of the lipid nanoparticle, we attach a special linker we developed called ASCET. The ASCET linker binds an antibody that recognizes a specific receptor on the cancer cells. After injecting the lipid nanoparticles into the patient's body, the antibody directs the lipid nanoparticles specifically to the cancer cells, sparing the healthy cells. The Cas9 mRNA is translated inside the cell to the Cas9 protein and then assembles with the guide RNA. The Cas9 guide RNA complex enters the nucleus and locates the mutated gene within the cancer cell's DNA. Once recognized, the CRISPR scalpels cut the gene and permanently disrupt it. The treated cancer cells can no longer divide, no matter how much they try, and eventually die. Thanks, Dan. I think now, we have to stop here. Precise approach yeah. can revolutionize. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I think I would uh, postpone the questions to the debate room. I also don't see a question. Uh, I can update that again, but I don't see a, a question in the question uh, panel. So I would like to come to the next presentation, which is from Mrs. Dobrovolskaya. She's director of operations of and head of immunology section on the, of the nanotechnology characterization lab in Frederick, USA. And um, that's really something we need to talk more, I guess, about uh, when we develop new particles and how we, um, what we do in order to get them into clinic. And I'm very keen to see what you, what you will tell us in order to get more of our nanoparticles into clinic and to do also the things in an experimental lab uh, in a way that we may be able to translate more. Thank you very much, Mr. Roskaya. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the introduction, and thank you, Biad, for uh, inviting me to talk. Uh, this is an outline of my presentation. I'm going to give you a very quick overview uh, of my lab. I will present a case study uh, from cancer personalized vaccine, and uh, the main portion of my presentation will be focused on challenge areas, and I will add with um, and with uh, future directions uh, in the field. So the nanotechnology characterization lab is located in Frederick, Maryland. We are a national and international resource for nanotechnology product developers. We've been in operation for over 17 years and we support extramural research community by uh, providing nanoparticle characterization via standardized assay cascade, which includes comprehensive physical chemical characterization in vitro and in vivo uh, immunology, pharmacology, toxicology. We also assist people with nano formulations. We are dedicated to cancer research, but currently we are all open to COVID-19 applications, and uh, there are a variety of mechanisms to collaborate with NCL. Please visit our new website to learn how to apply, or also feel free to contact me by uh, uh, email. So in the last 17 years, we characterized over 450 unique nanoparticle formulations and even more uh, like literally thousands of relevant controls and precursors. And as you see from this pie chart, uh, more than a half of the formulations that passed through the NCLSA cascade uh, deliver cancer chemotherapeutics. However, we do work with other uh, indications, including immunotherapy, vaccines, antivirals. And here you see the breakdown of the types of cancers with uh, breast cancer, pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, and um, uh, the brain cancer, uh, glioblastoma, dominating the landscape of the materials that pass through the NCLSA cascade. So in preclinical development, there are three key areas that researchers have to uh, address. One is chemistry and manufacturing control, uh, another one is safety, and lastly, efficacy. Uh, at the NCL, we mainly focus on CMC and safety. However, the studies that we conduct provide mechanistic insight into the efficacy of nanoformulations. So in the uh, case study, I would like to talk about our collaboration with Avidia Therapeutics. Uh, these are uh, a small biotech company uh, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Jeffrey Lean and Andrew uh, Ishizuka at the uh, uh, Avidia developed a polymeric micelle delivery platform that they use for delivery of uh, drugs and adjuvants and uh, antigens for vaccine indications. And so in this case, they applied this platform to uh, deliver TLR7-8 uh, agonist and a peptide, a mixture of the peptides selected from the cancer of individual patients for the personalized therapeutic cancer vaccine. And they demonstrated, and they published this study in Nature Biotechnology that applying these nanotechnology platforms helps to improve delivery of uh, adjuvant and antigen to draining lymph nodes, uh, helps to recruit uh, antigen presenting cells, improve the uptake of vaccines by antigen presenting cells, and stimulate uh, robust cytotoxic T lymphocytes response. Uh, during the characterization of these platforms at the NCL, we conducted multiple studies. I'm showing here uh, just a snapshot of these studies. We found a very strong, robust interferon response that included all three types of interferons, type 1, type 2, type 3. We observed pro-inflammatory cytokines and danger signals and chemokines, all of which were consistent with the intended mechanism of action of this formulation, and specifically TLR7-8 agonist that was used uh, as an adjuvant in this formulation. Most importantly, or most interestingly, uh, we found that uh, TLR7-8 agonist, which is uh, then it is unformulated, induces a more potent, meaning more broad, and uh, a greater uh, 
uh, induction of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, then the same agonist formulated on nanotechnology platform. So this implied an improved safety of the nano formulation because as you know, TLR7 and 8 as many TLR agonists are beautiful adjuvants, but they are just too strong and this is limits their clinical application. We also found that nanoparticle platform by itself is not inert and contributes to the immune stimulation by inducing chemokines, thereby contributing to the efficacy so the key take home message from all of this work that we conducted is that each component of the nano formulation has a role. The antigen, agonist, and the carrier all contribute to the property of the uh, final product. And therefore, each formulation has to be considered as a whole product and studies of individual components are important to provide some uh, mechanistic insight. So now let's talk about challenge areas. There are a lot of challenges in preclinical development. I highlighted here some of the key challenges. One of them is despite over a decade of research, still we need to improve fundamental understanding about how immune cells recognize and process nanoparticular vaccine components, including carriers, adjuvants, and antigens. Uh, still, we need to improve uh, the harmonization of the models in vitro and in vivo that we use to characterize nanoparticle-based formulations, including vaccine formulations. Um, uh, in the safety area, uh, alteration in immune cell function and ways to prevent it or direct it only towards the desirable uh, alteration is another challenge. So is immunogenicity of nanocarrier components, contamination with and detection of innate immunity modulating impurities such as endotoxin, beta-glucans, CPG DNA, and so forth, and by distribution of nanoparticles after local injection, uh, as well as ways to control it. Due to the uh, time limitations in the rest of my presentation, I will focus on these uh, challenge areas. So let's talk about the methodological models and harmonization. This is a snapshot from the study that we conducted at NCL in collaboration with the FDA. Uh, and it shows that very simple uh, logistical things such as blood handling and uh, storage influences dramatically the way uh, uh, the models uh, in preclinical characterization. Uh, this is cell recovery, cell viability, and most importantly, cells' responses to immunologically active agonists, uh, some of them are modification or derivatives of which are used in vaccines as vaccine adjuvant. So PBMCs uh, isolated fresh from the freshly derived whole blood appear to be the best model, but this model is not broadly available to all research lab, and this is a real challenge. Uh, NCL is part of the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research, and uh, FNL uh, recently launched a new standardization um, initiative called Star Trek. If you are interested in collaborating with us, NCL is part of the Star Trek initiative, please visit it on the website or let me know and I will direct you um, to more resources. Um, uh, I mentioned the uh, need for uh, improvement of fundamental understanding of nanoparticle interaction with the immune system. The main challenge here is that each nanoparticle is unique. So uh, each, uh, 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 studying each nanoparticle may inform uh, analysis of other nanoparticles, but uh, each particle goes through its own unique way of characterization and is full with uh, particle relevant um, uh, discoveries. And it requires a multidisciplinary approach so in this study, uh, I show you the results of collaboration uh, between our lab and uh, Professor Afonin at the University of North Carolina. Professor Afonin's team develops nanoparticles that are made of RNA or DNA, so the nucleic acid nanoparticles, and they develop these materials as vaccine adjuvants. The study that was conducted at NCL included structure activity relationship in which we showed that the material composition, the three-dimensional shape, but not the sequence complementary. Uh, determine the magnitude of the interferon response uh, to these materials. Most importantly, then we did cellular and molecular 
uh, mechanistic studies to understand the recognition, we found that TLR7, but not TLR3, is responsible for recognition of RNA cubes. So the question that came up after this discovery is, is it an artifact in the in vitro system, or does it have uh, a scientific ground? So we collaborated with Professor Dakalian at the Penn State, whose team applied molecular dynamic simulation to confirm that indeed there is a scientific ground. The interaction between TLR7 and RNA cubes are real. Uh, further, we collaborated with National Center for Advanced and Translational Sciences, um, uh, and uh, Dr. Zakharov and his team applied machine learning to develop quantitative structure activity relationship that allows entering the or analyzing the structural uh, materials, uh, the structural aspects of uh, nucleic acid nanoparticles to predict the ability to induce interference. The key message that we learned from this collaboration is the quality of uh, uh, physical chemical characterization and biological immunological characterization of these particles uh, is very important to enable prediction of nanoparticle immunological properties by computer algorithms. So if the vaccine uh, delivers antigen in the form of mRNA. Uh, if the antigen contains epitopes cross-reacting with epitopes present in normal tissues, one of the questions during preclinical characterization is whether or not such formulation may alter immune function in a way to lead to autoimmunity. And uh, the biggest challenge in addressing this question is that variety of research models are available. However, none of these models can accurately predict what happens in the human. And this is why I believe that it is important to utilize all available resources to uh, further explore this question. So particularly in this case, uh, this is a study conducted in our lab with mRNA formulation. We showed uh, a slight but statistically significant increase in the kidney score, which reflects the kidney damage by uh, immune complexes after uh, formulation, uh, administering this formulation formulation and waiting for uh, uh, nine months uh, after this administration. And uh, the questions that we are interested in is how manipulating particle size, charge, surface coatings, shape, routes of administration, dose, dosing schedule, and excipients and impurities, both biological and chemical, may help us to bring this level down to the level of the negative control. Also to understand how this uh, direct, indirect, and secondary uh, parameters uh, contribute to this response and which of them, if at all, uh, can make it uh, worse and bring it to the level of the positive control. So understanding these parameters uh, uh, is very important to enable development of safe vaccine, uh, nanoparticle-based vaccine formulations. So anti-PEG antibody uh, subject was already mentioned. Uh, another challenge area is immunogenicity of uh, nanocarrier and nanocarrier components. So PEG-reactive antibodies are detected in uh, healthy individuals, and there are plenty of literature uh, uh, in this case. Uh, I hope that uh, Sir William Shakespeare uh, forgives me for taking a phrase from his famous play and rephrasing it to pegylate or not to pegylate. That is the question. That is a real question, because in the literature, you now see a lot of attempts due to this pre-existing and induced anti bag antibodies and their implications in the safety and efficacy of nanotechnology-based formulations to come up with uh, PEG alternatives. Um, the challenge in this area is that there is no ideal PEG alternative. Common immune-mediated uh, reactions to other uh, polymeric alternatives of PEG include immunogenicity, allergy, and hypersensitivity reactions. And therefore, it is important to analyze these alternatives uh, both alone and in the context of the whole product to consider excipients, carrier, antigens, route of administration, dose and dose regime. Um, and finally, I think it is important to realize that uh, nanoparticles are not immunologically inert. An immune system is versatile enough to recognize nanocarriers by uh, inducing both cellular and biochemical responses, which includes activation of immune cells, uh, complement system, results in production of reactive oxygen, species cytokines, histamines, tryptase, secondary uh, factors. All of these cellular biochemical responses 
are required for vaccine efficacy, but they also contribute to immune-mediated side effects. And this is why, when it comes to using nanoparticles for vaccine delivery, it is important in preclinical stage to understand what happens to the nanoparticles after injections. Do they stay at the site of injection? Do they distribute uh, to systemic circulation? If they distribute to systemic circulation, what healthy organs and tissue they can go to uh, to understand potential of target effects? Um, so obviously there is plenty uh, of work that we uh, as community have to do in this direction. With this, I would like to thank my colleagues at the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab and thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Marina, for this uh, overview of what can be done, what should be done, and what we are doing or what you are doing in your lab. I just uh, refreshed the questions page. There's no new question for this talk and also for the others. So maybe you can uh, enter your maybe, questions. Maybe I have a question. Sure. Um, we have touched upon the, the anti peg antibodies a lot um, already. Uh, to me, as a, as a dermatologist who's also involved in, uh, in allergy, uh, it seems that the relevant anti -peg antibodies are those that are of the IgE type. And um, is it clear that the IgG or IgM anti PEG antibodies are in any of any clinical relevance to patients? Have we, can we assess or attribute any pathology to those antibodies? Uh, this is a good question. So actually, uh, Dr. Mariana Castells at Harvard and uh, Elizabeth Phillips uh, in Vanderbilt uh, uh, conducted a lot of studies and they published several uh, recent you know, papers demonstrating that anti peg IgEs are more frequent than originally it was expected. And uh, uh, both through allergy, which is IgE-mediated allergy to polyethylene glycol is a reality, as well as pseudo-allergic reactions such as uh, those triggered by complement. I had one question, a uh, great talk, by the way. I was wondering, you mentioned biodistribution is something that you look at with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. I know they contain PEG, and then my understanding of PEG is that it's not biodegradable. Um, I'm just curious what happens to the PEG in those vaccines? Um, this is a great question. Uh, we at NCL did not work with Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, but I would like to point you, and if you would like, I can share it by email. There is a recent study from Stanford published in April's issue of Nature Immunology, uh, in which they worked with Pfizer vaccine, and uh, they uh, investigated it uh, in the context of both biodistribution and uh, mechanisms of immunogenicity. So I'll, I'll, I'll share out this paper with you without, you know, uh, retelling the, somebody else's story. No further questions. So I guess we'd like to thank you for your talk and move on to the final speaker of this session, which would be um, Andreas Wagner. Um, he's uh, the head of liposome technology at Polo, uh, Polymoon Scientific um, in Klosterneuburg in Austria. And, um, and Dr. Wagner, your talk will be uh, on guiding mRNA lipid nanoparticle drug products from early R&D programs to the market. Um, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, very good. So first of all, I would like to thank Beat and the organizing committee to giving uh, me the chance to present uh, how we contribute to this area. We are more in the in the process from a process perspective to, to look into this uh, different to the uh, other uh, talks we have seen before. So uh, brief introduction, Polymoon is a, a mid-sized company located in Austria. We are currently around uh, 100 employees and the company was originally founded in 1992, more in the field of biopharmaceuticals. As you can imagine, we have been uh, uh, regularly inspected by the Austrian authorities uh, on behalf of EMA, but also in the past there was an FDA audit and working as a CDMO in this 
uh, fields. Uh, you can imagine that a lot of our clients and, and uh, regulatory authorities uh, come to us and, and look what we are doing and look into our quality systems. Uh, the uh, core activities uh, at Polymoon, as I mentioned before, originally the company was founded to uh, produce and develop uh, antibodies and other biopharmaceuticals. And since many years, we are, uh, have a strong focus here in the field of, of HIV. We are taking part of, of many uh, consortia for uh, different grants. And the other area where I'm responsible for is the contract development and manufacturing of uh, LNPs and liposomal formulations, where we are also now almost 20 years in this business. Uh, over these many years, we have uh, developed with and for our clients processes uh, from a very early stage up to the clinical uh, development for uh, siRNA, so uh, small oligonucleotides. And over the recent years, we moved more and more into the mRNA formulation area. Uh, what I liked a lot in, in the last talk that we heard uh, is that people are still using uh, liposomal formul formulations containing MPLA, in combination with QS21 and then other uh, adjuvant systems. And here we have also a very good track record to produce uh, large amounts for, for different uh, clinical studies of, of these kinds of, of liposomal adjuvants. Uh, over the last two, two and a half years, we have been heavily involved in uh, the process development and production of, of COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, we have heard today uh, a lot of uh, BioNTech Pfizer vaccines, where I will give a, a little bit more insight how Polymon contributed here uh, during uh, the last uh, two and a half years. But uh, we have been also working close with, with CureVac and are still working close with them in their attempts to develop different kinds of, of vaccines. We have been working close with Robin Shattuck's labs at the Imperial College London also to develop an um, uh, mRNA vaccine for the uh, treatment of, 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 of COVID. And here this study is still ongoing in, in Uganda. Uh, quite recently, Arcturus Therapeutics uh, published uh, data from an uh, ongoing study, phase three study in, in Vietnam, which they closed successfully. Uh, so we have other activities as well, but uh, for the next slide, I will look more into the uh, contribution from Polymon in the field of mRNA, LNP, therapeutics, and vaccines. So not too much to say about the, the mRNA vaccines. Uh, we, we heard a lot about them during this meeting and also uh, over uh, the last two years. But what is the key fact here for me and uh, why we were lucky to be in the position to, to work in this field is that this uh, mRNA molecule needs to be uh, in, in a kind of delivery vehicle to be updated uh, from the cells to be protected uh, from the biological environment. And as I have uh, mentioned a few slides ago, Polymon is active in this field now for almost 20 years, uh, we were right in the position and at the right time uh, being there to uh, support all these kinds of programs. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, mRNA ones uh, encapsulated uh, in, in LMPs is injected and then uptake, in, uptake into the cells uh, from where in the late endosome it's, it's released and the mRNA is delivered to the ribosome where the uh, protein, the antigen, is, is produced, uh, which then uh, stimulates the immune system. So uh, also here, this is some information we have already heard uh, today, but uh, these uh, LNPs contain normally of, of the basic formula is, is that they contain of an ionizable lipid, of a PEC lipid, uh, cholesterol, and, and a phosphatidylcholine. And it's important to 
uh, define the, the optimal ratio of these components, but also the ratio of, of mRNA to the ionizable component. And as uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Moimi before, the PEC lipid uh, has from a structural perspective and from a process perspective, uh, the impact that uh, this uh, component leads to the formation of, of very small uniform vesicles, as you can see here in these uh, electron micrograph. So in brief, the process to uh, make this kind of, of LNPs uh, seems to be uh, rather easy. Uh, you combine the lipid components, which are pre-dissolved in an ethanol solution with an mRNA uh, in, in a acidified uh, buffer. Uh, this acidified buffer is, is important uh, to uh, have the ionizable lipid uh, showing or, or being in, in uh, showing a, a positively a positive charge and to get in interaction with the negatively charged uh, mRNA. Uh, this uh, controlled mixing to generate uh, these uh, LNPs is often uh, uh, followed by an online dilution with either the same type of buffer, but also uh, we have it shown in the past in the preparation of, of LNPs for, for oligonucleotides that you could immediately also use this dilution step to change the, the pH of the supernatant uh, and, and to stabilize uh, by this also the, the LMP formation process. Uh, in, a, in a second step, uh, after this LMP formation, uh, the buffer has to be exchanged in the TFF process. The ethanol has to be removed to generate uh, stable particles, and the concentration has to be adjusted in an ultrafiltration process. Uh, final production steps uh, in this, uh, for this kind of, of mRNA LNPs uh, are, is a compounding step to, to add some cryoprotectant, which allows uh, freezing after the sterile fill and finish step. When we start with these kind of uh, processes, uh, there are a lot of things that have to be considered already at the beginning uh, of, of this uh, process uh, development phase. Uh, parts of it are already uh, set in stone as, as these formulations are developed by, by specialist companies who uh, own the IP of, of these kind of, of formulations, we all heard about them, uh, like the, the lipid composition, the ratio of, of the lipid components, but also the ratio of, of lipids to mRNA. Uh, what, what is also important and, and what has to be really worked uh, rather intense on from the beginning is the aqueous phase where the mRNA is uh, dissolved because this has an impact on the formulation behavior itself. But uh, please don't forget about these uh, large mRNA structures are not the most stable ones. And if you keep them for too long time at, at this low pH uh, at room temperature, you will for sure observe some degradation. So here you have to look into process conditions which allows scaling up uh, to industrial scale, but still keeping your components stable. Uh, the ratio uh, of the aqueous phase to the solvent and the solvent type is uh, also a rather important point here. Uh, we normally uh, try to, to go with, with ethanol as the uh, standard uh, class uh, free solvent. And sometimes uh, it takes some work to convince our clients uh, to move to this type of solvent instead of using any other solvent like methanol, which was their preference in their lab scale work. But uh, this is a kind of solvent that should be avoided. In the LNP formation step, which is the, the first process step uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in this three step process, uh, you have to optimize the, the concentration of the mRNA 
in the acidified buffer as well as the lipids in ethanol. You have to adjust the flow rates and flow rate ratio to, to generate uh, optimal conditions uh, for the formulation of, of, of these LMPs. Uh, by the uh, pump types that you use for this uh, defined mixing process, you have to take care to avoid uh, pumps which generate uh, high pulsation or even worse, uh, cavitation is, is something that you should avoid because this will for sure lead to degradation of your components. As I mentioned before, this inline dilution, here you can vary with the, with the type of buffer, with the ionic strength, with the, uh, you can already add, uh, 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 at this step, the cryoprotect and you don't have to add it at the final uh, compounding step, et cetera, et cetera. A very important point here is that uh, during this step, you can reduce your ethanol concentration and remember the ethanol is needed to solubilize uh, the lipids uh, in advance. But you have, before you enter into the TFF process, which is the subsequent step, you have to bring the ethanol concentration below a certain limit. Otherwise, your LMPs uh, will, will uh, get into troubles will get damaged during the next step. Uh, process temperature is a critical uh, point here as well. As I mentioned before, low pH uh, and, and increased temperatures uh, have to uh, be avoided. Uh, and the combination of an aqueous phase and the lipids in ethanol is an exogenic, uh, exothermic uh, reaction. And here you have to especially take care during the formation process. As I mentioned, the next step is the TFF process. Here you need to really optimize the loading of drug product per membrane area, the shear rate, and all these uh, uh, technical parameters, because what you want to avoid here is, is fouling within the systems. And in the worst case, if, if you do not have these parameters under control, your permeate flow will go down the fibers uh, will, will uh, clog, and, and, uh, and this is something that you really want to avoid. So this uh, process step of the TFF uh, it really needs to be under control. Again, here the process temperature, and uh, last but not least, the, the TFF sequence. So if you start with a dye filtration to get rid of an maybe too high ethanol concentration in the beginning, and this then uh, to be continued by an auto filtration process and so on. So this is something you have to figure out uh, how it's uh, done best to generate uh, uh, minimal losses, high process yields and, and stable particles. Finally, the, the very final step uh, at the fill and finish, you also have to optimize your chosen uh, filter membrane material, the loading rate, et cetera, et cetera, flow rate uh, to uh, avoid again losses here and generate stable uh, LMPs. This is the beginning. What we have done uh, extensively during the last one and a half years is uh, to work on scale-up strategies for these type of processes, because you can imagine in the beginning uh, very low amounts are needed in the low 100, 200 milligram range of mRNA input, but to allow and build processes uh, which uh, where a billion doses uh, need to be produced, there is a lot of uh, technical uh, optimization needed, which was done uh, partially in our labs, partially with, with partners at BioNTech or, or Pfizer. And, and here is a brief overview how it was possible to go from the low uh, milligram uh, batch sizes up to uh, the several hundred gram mRNA input ranges. Uh, this is a, a brief view on, on uh, some uh, mid-scale processes that we do at Polymoon. This is, for instance, a, a TFF process. What you see here, we can, and on the right side, you will see the LMP formation step where we have the lipid solution, uh, which is combined with the mRNA solution using this type of, of piston pumps. Uh, as uh, you can imagine, 
not just for the process development, but then also for the routine production, you have to uh, take care of uh, building up sufficient quality control parameters. Uh, these are in the, the general basic parameters where you need to define and, and control your, your process and for IPCs and for final drug product testing. A uh, brief overview of uh, how this uh, really project Lightspeed, as it was mentioned in, in one of the books describing uh, this program, uh, could be achieved. So there was a lot of things ongoing in parallel, uh, not just at, at BioNTech or Pfizer, but also in, in our labs to support the program throughout the whole clinical uh, development uh, and then to build up stock uh, once the material was approved for emergency use authorization or for in Europe for the market. Uh, here is the next few slides give you a very brief uh, overview uh, when how this was done. So we started in early 2020. We have been contacted by uh, the uh, project teams at, at BioNTech with whom we already have been working closely on, on, on other mRNA programs. And since uh, the initial discussions with the partners in, in early February, we continuous with, with a lot of, of uh, tox uh, material production in our labs to, to run uh, multiple tox studies uh, to support uh, multiple tox studies in parallel. Uh, while we were still uh, formulating uh, tox batches of, of newer versions of, of, of or newer mRNA constructs. We were then already producing uh, GMP batches to initiate, uh, to allow them, our partners, to initiate the clinical trials. And in addition, uh, like we do it also for other programs, we started the test transfer to the BioNTech Pfizer network. Uh, this was then uh, continued with uh, multiple uh, batches, scale-up activities, and sending out uh, uh, colleagues from, from my team uh, to the uh, partners to, to support their uh, technical setup, the, the test transfer batches, and so on. In parallel, our regulatory team uh, supported the, the experts at, at the partner companies for IMD, IMP, IMPD submission documents and later stage also with activities uh, for uh, the process validation and then for the documents, for the regulatory documents to support the market approval. Uh, until uh, early uh, 2021, uh, we have been uh, continuously producing for the market uh, for this kind of project, but we have still supported uh, other programs where I've shown the list before uh, uh, for, for their clinical trials, which, as I mentioned, uh, also shown quite recently uh, for a successful uh, readout of, of their studies. Uh, all these efforts uh, led into a very nice uh, story about uh, our company in the, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and this is, I guess, what, what we and, and what my colleagues are really proud about. By this uh, kind of work uh, we have done over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, really a high number of, of GMP productions for, for small oligonucleotides over the last few years, uh, quite a, a high number of, of mRNA therapeutics and vaccines uh, with, with intermediate batch volumes of, of more than 500 liters. We at Polymoon can go up for mRNA inputs of up to 40 grams. Uh, we know specialized uh, big pharma companies can go much higher, uh, but what we have is, is a rather flexible system to start with new programs and, and uh, bring them up to this scale, which is quite uh, a lot for, for early stage programs. We also can do the, the full fill and finish uh, for, for these early uh, clinical trials. For market, for sure, this capacity would not be sufficient. By this, uh, I would like to end and uh, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you very much for this.
very nice talk and uh, I, I should say success story that you presented. Are there any questions on, uh, on manufacturing processes uh, and upscaling of vaccine lipid nanoparticles? Um, let me just see in the in the chat. Actually, I do not see any any question in the chat, but maybe I can ask you: um, Is it proprietary to ask you about costs of production? Um, so, if one would be at an early stage of clinical development and uh, would like to test this or prepare substances for first in men, at what cost range are you looking at? Yeah, so I will for sure <laughs> not tell here a, a, a number, <laughs> but but what I can tell you is that uh, it uh, the the range of costs varies from the stage of the process, how it's transferred to us. If there is, uh, for instance, uh, the, the formulation and initial microfluidic process already set up, we can take all this information from there and go rather fast via a, a tech transfer to a, a first tox batch and then into the clinics. Uh, if we all know about the costs of these proprietary lipids as well as the, the mRNA, uh, and, and our activity is, is below that. This is something I can say. I'm just looking at the chat again. Um, maybe in the meantime, another question from my side. Um, does it, does the, the nature of the RNA um, play a big, or is that a big confounding variable to production of the lipid nanoparticles? So could it be that the structure of the RNA, of the particular RNA you're trying to encapsulate, um, makes it more or less difficult to form a nanoparticle? Yes, absolutely. And uh, this is, but this is always in combination with the with the lipid uh, composition you're using. We are we are working close with uh, different uh, companies uh, to offer this service to develop and 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 out license these lipid formulations and with some of them we see it's very straightforward going for a self-amplifying vaccine uh, uh, mRNA for instance because we all know that this is really the, the Champions League formulating them because these components are quite big 10-12 thousand bases uh, and, and some uh, formulations we really see hur hurdles to, to formulate them, uh, this kind of RNA. What we also have seen and observed over the last years, and there were uh, nice papers published, I think it was by, by some Moderna people, there is an impact on the quality of the ionizable lipid, uh, which then might get get an interaction with, with the mRNA and, and lead some, some specific aggregates, uh, which, which can become a hurdle from a uh, regulatory perspective by the end of the day. So it's there are a lot of things you have to take care of. Uh, not forget about the RNA stability itself in the acidified buffer, as I mentioned, and, and the temperature and process temperature and so on. So, But in general, uh, I really have to thank these companies who develop these type of formulations. Uh, for their high quality and, and these formulations. At some point, it's a little bit more plug and play. And that's, that's very nice in, in, in our job here. All right. So I think we are finished with this session. I thought it was a very interesting one. And thank all the speakers for their really excellent talks. I think we do have some more time to uh, discuss in the debate lounge and uh, you, all of you find uh, a button underneath the, uh, the main screen. So uh, if there is anything else to discuss, please enter the debate lounge, uh, which will be open now.